From Hollywood, it's the new Edgar Bergen Hour with Charlie McCarthy. Now, quit you say, help me, I'll mow you down. It's Sunday night, and time again transcribed for Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy with Mortimer Snurd, Effie Clinker, Gary Crosby, Carol Richards, Ray Noble, Jack Kirkwood, the Mellow Man, yours truly, John Heaston, and our special guests, Dr. Frederick Webb Hodge, world's leading authority on the American Indian, and Jack Benny. Ladies and gentlemen, this past weekend, Edgar Bergen attached his trailer to the back of his car. And he and Charlie were off to Palm Springs for a glorious and inexpensive vacation in the sun. As it turned out, it wasn't as inexpensive as they thought. But to see what happened, let's look in on Edgar and Charlie as they approach Palm Springs with Edgar behind the wheel. Denim toupee and his high button shoes. All right, Charlie. Uh, yeah. Say, are you enjoying this ride? It's okay. Can't you go a little faster in this thing? Well, we're moving right along as it is. After all, we just passed three cars. Yeah, but they were parked. Oh, I see. <laughs> Say, you better check our trailer back there. How does it look? Well, it looks a little like Elsa Maxwell doing a rumba. Is there? <laughs> Ah, oh, speed it up, Bergen. Step on it, little out. Well, now, take it easy. We're entering Palm Springs now. Oh, look over there. Somebody left a golf club lying in the sand there. <laughs> Silly. That's Frank Sinatra taking a sun bath. Oh, <laughs> oh you're right. Yeah. Well, now, we better keep our eye open for this Blue Skies Trailer Village. Yeah. You know, that's the one that Jack Benny is part owner of. Yeah. And, you know, he promised to give us a very special rate. Jack did? Yes. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. He is he is a tough man to tangle with over Monday. <laughs> yeah, you both throw pennies around like manhole covers. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hey, now, 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 that must be Jack Benny's trailer over there. Look at the sign in front. Free water, free electricity, and also free violin lessons. Uh, <laughs> that slight extra charge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the place, all right. I'll pull in. All right. There we go. Ah, well, here we are, Charlie. Now, there must be a parking attendant. Oh, here's one coming towards us, yes. Uh, park your car for two bits, sir. <laughs> Jack Benny. <laughs> Jack, how come that you're parking cars? Oh, I'll do anything to make a buck. Oh, I see. Gentlemen, welcome to the Blue Skies Trailer Village, surrounded by swaying palm trees, and you're welcome to pick all the dates you can eat. Oh, well, that's really swell. For 69 cents a pound. Oh. <laughs> Here, Edgar, have a date. I hope you don't mind if I take it out of your first pound. Uh, no, no. We'd save money by getting out of here now. No, no. <laughs> now, don't knock my little business, Charlie. A man my age has to start thinking about his future. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jack, what is your age? Now, there's been a lot of kidding. Now, how about settling it once and all? Uh, just how old are you, Jack? 39. 39. <laughs> Going on 38. Go on. <laughs> Face it, Buster, the only way you'll ever see 50 again is on a speedometer. <laughs> hmm. hmm. That's a nice line for a guest star. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jack, but our trailer wasn't big enough to bring any riders along, you see. Really? But this is quite a trailer park you've got here. Very nice. Well, I'm just running it as a sideline, after all. Who knows, as a comedian, I may not be able to go on forever, well, haven't you already? <laughs> hmm. They did it to me again. <laughs> well, anyway, Jack, we're here, and we'd like to check in. Gee, I don't know, Edgar. We have a certain standard to maintain, and your trailer is pretty old. Oh. Just look how thin those tires are. I mean, you can see right through the rubber. Oh, you can. Now, now keep your hands off those tires, Jack. Just stop feeling those tires, Jack. Yeah. 
I'm sorry, Edgar. I forgot about my hangnail. Yeah. <laughs> now what will we do? Well, I also fix tires. Yeah, I see. I'll do anything for a buck. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's a dollar. Go get a manicure. <laughs> now, where can I put that uh, junkie? Edgar, tell you what I'll do. I'll put you way down at the end, right next to the road. Well, why, why down there next to the road? Yeah, you, your trailer will be all right. There, people will think it's just an accident. Oh. <laughs> bad. Oh, come on, Bergie. Let's take the spot here and check in. Come on. Uh, well, now, okay. Now, uh, where's the desk clerk? Desk clerk? <clears throat> Care to register, sir? You mean you? I told you, I'll do anything for a buck. Yeah. Now, we're saving on actors this way. <laughs> Now, you'd better tell us. Now, uh, what are your rates? Uh... Oh, you'll find me very cheap. Yes, we have. Yeah, all right. <laughs> He's a regular naughty pine Fred Allen. <laughs> I threw that in myself. You yeah. know. <laughs> they had me down for another hmm. <laughs> Jack, you, you still have avoided uh, telling us what your rates are. That is special rates for Fred. Well, what would you say to $9 a night? No. Oh, come now. You wouldn't charge that much to poor little old me, would you? Certainly. That's how I got to be rich little old me. Yeah, I <laughs> Well, I won't pay a cent over $2, so I guess the deal is off then. Now, wait a minute. Come wait a minute. That was, that was my first offer. Yeah, well, you're crushing my carnation. No, all right. Then. How about eight seventy five? Two twenty five is as high as I'll go. Oh. <laughs> this is the Battle of the Titans. <laughs> Tighter Titans I've never seen either. Oh. Now, 850, not a penny no, lower. Ridiculous. 350. 825. 375. That's Eight. Eight dollars. Four dollars. 775. Oh, Jack, what are we arguing about? Blood. That's what you're arguing about. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Edgar, I don't want to quibble over a few bucks. Let's settle for five dollars. Oh, okay. That's a deal, Jack. You're... Ladies and gentlemen, the preceding scene starring Edgar Bergen and Jack Benny was from the picture. Money is a many splendor thing. <laughs> I'll trade you that for the hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you did better with hmm. <laughs> well, yeah. we're all set then, aren't we? Yeah, it ought to be fun staying here at the Blue Skies Trailer Village, especially with you, one of the owners, Mr. Benny. You know, you're such a popular celebrity. And such a good comedian. Oh, you're just saying that. No, no. If I was saying it, you wouldn't come out so good. <laughs> I wonder what Don Wilson would charge to sit on him. Yeah. <laughs> Jack, how about showing us around the place a little bit? Sure, yeah? sure. I'll be glad to. All right. Now, uh, over here is our swimming pool. Oh, yeah. Of course, yeah. you know, there's a 25-cent service charge per person if you use the swimming pool. Well, that's so. fair enough. It's reasonable. When there's water in it, it's a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> if I know Bergen, he'll take it dry. Oh. <laughs> then there's our lovely bathroom over here. Oh, so there's the... Ba oh, no! What's the matter? <laughs> I peeked inside. Parking meters. Oh, no. That time they didn't even give me hmm. <laughs> oh, gentlemen, before I forget, we have another special service here at the Blue Skies Trailer Village. For a very slight extra charge, you're furnished with entertainment. Uh, what kind of entertainment, Jack? Oh, it's the best. Really yeah. outstanding. I go from trailer to trailer playing requests on my violin. He'll do anything for a buck, yeah. <laughs> Let me ask, how much does it cost not to have you play your violin? You couldn't afford it. I... <laughs> Maybe we just ought to buy earplugs. Well, I'll oh. show you how everyone here in the trailer park feels about my violin playing. Uh -huh. <laughs> You've stopped playing. You're putting your violin away. I'll do anything, even that for a buck. I... <laughs> okay, come on back, folks. Park your car for a quarter. Two bits, right this way. Oh, 
Well, Charlie, wasn't it wonderful of Jack Benny to drop in on us? Yeah, but that that business of him being only 39. <laughs> well, we can't question it unless we have positive information. Well, I got it, yeah. While he was in there, I took a peek at his driving license. Oh, you did? Yeah. What did it say? It said for covered wagons only. Oh, no. <laughs> That's ridiculous, Charlie. Hello, Edgar. Hiya, Charlie. Well, it's Gary Crosby. <laughs> you know, Gary, we were just speaking about one of your father's partners in the Blue Skies Trailer Village. But tell me, Gary, how do you feel about trailer living? It's, it's really a great life, Edgar, but, uh, but, as he said, recognizing a song cue when he hears one, but not for me. <laughs> They're writing songs of love, but not for me. A lucky star's above, but not for me. With love to lead the way, I found more clouds of gray than any old Russian play could guarantee. Well, I was a fool to fall and get that way. I hope will last and also lack a day. Although I can't dismiss the memory of her kiss, I know it's not for me. To lead the way I found more clouds of gray Than any old Russian play could guarantee I, I, I was a fool To fall and get that way High ho alas And also lack a day Although I can't dismiss the memory of her kiss, I know it's not for me. No, it's not, not for me. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here is where we take care of you do-it-yourself fans as we proudly present our genius of all trades, Professor Kirkwood and his do-it-yourself department. At the rate you've been going with that bus saw, you must be down to about two fingers. Uh, how many? Two fingers. I don't mind if I do. No chaser, please. <laughs> Professor, what is your subject for tonight? Tonight's subject will be how to make money at home with my print-it-yourself kit. <laughs> now, 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 just a second, Professor. This money that you're going to show us how to print, it can't be genuine. So what? Listen, son, we're living in the age of falsies. No. <laughs> Teeth, hair, shoulders, and other things too humorous to mention. <laughs> I say, pardon me, old boy, but, but are you allowed to print money yourself? Why, certainly. Haven't you ever heard of freedom of the press? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 just a second. Now, let's stop this foolishness. Kirkwood, I'm sure, I'm positive it's against the law to print real money. Well, that's where we play it smart. Oh. We don't print real money, we just print counterfeit money. Oh. <laughs> Kirkwood, you, you should be ashamed. Don't you, don't you ever think of anything except money? Well, sometimes I think about women. Oh? <laughs> what kind of women? Women with money. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh I got them covered in gold. Yeah. <laughs> All I can say to you is this money alone does not bring happiness. No, but it sure makes your unhappiness awfully present. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, Professor, I'm sorry. I must disagree with you. There are no shortcuts to easy money. Remember, real money doesn't grow on trees. Yours did, boy. <laughs> oh, I made it 
tell me out of him then. <laughs> Uh, no, I say, Kirk, with old chap, look, is this money you print any good? Well, uh, let's put it this way. Uh-huh. It's like the Hollywood freeway. Dangerous, but passable. <laughs> Which reminds me, Ray, I could use you. Uh-huh. Do you think you could pass a $20 bill? Well, certainly, old boy, if it'll pull over to the right. <laughs> You're not laughing. <laughs> and that's the way it's going to be. Now don't, don't let him talk you into a thing, Ray. I wouldn't touch his counterfeit money with a ten-foot pole. Now how about a nine-foot Romanian? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, oh, turn the fan on, Mother. I'm hot tonight. <laughs> Well, I don't want to cool you off, but <laughs> where did you learn to print money? Oh, this uh, money-making skill runs in my family. Oh, it does, does yes, it? Yes, my father taught my brother how to make hundred-dollar bills, and now he's got life with father. Uh-huh. <laughs> and how about you, Kirkwood? Have you ever been in jail? <laughs> oh, have I ever been in jail? <laughs> I've been in stir more often than the paddles of a mix master. <laughs> well, well, you've certainly got the bowl for it now. <laughs> You're talking with that lazy Susan back there. Yeah. Well, I'm relaxing. Back to the subject: <clears throat> how to make your own money. <laughs> Oh, oh it, it's it's the police, Kirkwood. You, they're probably after you. Oh, oh, wonderful. You're happy about it? Of course. No. Oh, it's depressing if they don't come and get you once in a while. I... Makes you feel sort of unwanted. <laughs> so long, boy. So long. Tune in next week, folks, when Professor Kirkwood's topic will be how to engineer your own jailbreak. Good night. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm extremely happy to be able to introduce to you once again our outstanding vocal group, the Mellow Men. What are you going to sing tonight, fellows? Dilly Dilly Austin Fair for Cats in Allen Bogan by the Sea. Uh, <laughs> yes, but what are you going to sing? Dilly Dilly Austin Fair for Cats. Never mind, just do it. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> There's a tiny house. There's a tiny house. By a tiny stream. By a tiny stream. Where a lovely lass. Where a lovely lass. Had a lovely dream. Had a lovely dream. And the dream came true. And the dream came true. Quite unexpectedly. In Gilly Gilly House and Pepper Cats and Ellen Bogan by the sea. She went out one day. She went out one day. Where the tulips grow. Where the tulips grow. When a handsome lad. When a handsome lad. Stopped to say hello. Stopped to say hello. And before she knew. And before she knew. He kissed her tenderly. In Gilly Gilly House and Pepper Cats and Ellen Morgan by the sea. A happy pair were married one Sunday afternoon. They left the church and ran away to spend their honeymoon. In a tiny house, in a tiny house, by a tiny stream, by a tiny stream, where the lovely lass, where the lovely lass, had a lovely dream, had a lovely dream, and the last I heard, and the last I heard, they still live happily. In Gilly Gilly, Austin Pepper, Cats and Ellen Bogan by the sea. In Gilly Gilly, Austin Pepper, Gilly Gilly, Austin Pepper, Cats and Ellen Bogan by the sea. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, we bring you one of the more popular portions of our program, our How to Stay Young department. 
And here to let us in on her secret of eternal youth is that all-time girl, just back from a rejuvenation course with Ali Khan, Miss Effie Clinker. <laughs> Oh, I may be falling apart, but I'm young at heart. Oh, and you look lovely tonight, Miss Clinker. Oh, yes. I believe in growing old gracefully. Yes. Or better still, disgracefully. <laughs> well, I think it's wonderful how you kept your um, youth. Yeah. How did you know about George? No, I didn't. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Now tell me, Miss Clinker, nowadays they give shots for almost everything. Are there any shots that you can recommend that make you feel younger? Oh, yes, indeed there are. Yes. After a few shots of scotch, you'd be surprised how young I feel. Now don't tell me that you that you indulge, you drink. Well, the doctor said for my health's sake I should Take a wee drop before going to bed, you know? Yes, yes, I see. Yeah. Of course, sometimes I find myself going to bed four and five times a night, though. <laughs> yes. yes, indeed, I really sleep tight. Yes. <laughs> Right now, it's time to answer some of your mail. No oh, good. Yeah. Well, hurry it up. It's getting close to one of my bedtimes. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> the first letter is from Minneapolis. Oh, that's nice up there. Yes. Uh, here it is. Dear Miss Clinker, I am 80 years old. Would it keep me young if I married a 20-year-old girl? Ahem. <clears throat> Sonny, <laughs> it would probably kill you. <laughs> it's like buying a steak when you haven't got any teeth. <laughs> All right, next letter. Uh, here's one from a listener in Cleveland. My dear Miss Clinker, I am 35 and I'm going with a used car salesman. Should I marry him? Why, if you love him, what if he is used? No. <laughs> I a lot of good mileage in him yet. Oh. <laughs> My dear Miss Stinker, no, Clinker. <laughs> What is the most important rule in staying young? Besides lying, that is. <laughs> well, I would say that good health is most important. Good health? Yes. People are too run down these days. Uh, run down? Yes. Uh, I say, uh, Effie, old girl, mm -hmm. would you say that I looked run down? <laughs> you look run over. <laughs> You've still got one more letter to answer. Dear Miss Clinker, do you ever wear a sweater to attract men? Me wear a sweater with my figure? <laughs> oh, silly boy. Well, that would be like trying to flag down the super chief with an empty can of sterno. Oh, I... <laughs> well, thank you, Miss Clinker. Our time is up. But before we go, do you have any last message? <clears throat> <clears throat> Sounds like your last one. No, I'm... <laughs> I don't know what's the matter with me. <clears throat> You've been taking care of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any last message to our audience? Yes. All of you men out there, take good care of yourselves. Heaven keep you. I wish I could afford it. <laughs>
The Edgar Bergen Hour, transcribed with Charlie McCarthy, Mortimer Snurd, Gary Crosby, Carol Richards, Jack Kirkwood, the Mellow Man, and Ray Noble, will be back after station identification. From Hollywood, it's the new Edgar Bergen Hour with Charlie McCarthy, Mortimer Snurd, Gary Crosby, Carol Richards, Jack Kirkwood, the Mellow Man, Ray Noble, and yours truly, John Heaston. smile again. Oh, like I snowed before. Do, do, de, do. All right, all right, that's enough now. Why such a sad song, Martin? Well, I'll tell you, Mr. Bergen, I, I sort of got the dismals today. The dismals? Yeah. I'm sort of down in the Humpty Dumps. I see. Why? Well, I'm kind of worried. Oh, I see. Worried about what? Mm, I see. Worried about what? Yeah. Oh, about what? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm worried about um, things back on the farm, mostly. We got 16 new mouths to feed now. Oh, a lot of baby pigs or chickens? No, it's my Uncle Sorghum and Aunt Bucilla and their kids. And their kids, yeah. It's Uncle Sorghum and his family. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't even know I had an Uncle Sorghum, and they all moved in, and they're living there now. Well, that's... How many How many children do you say? Sixteen. Are you sure there are sixteen? Well, let me see. There's, uh, there's Vestibula, Twitchy, Narrowhead, Tungus and Grunion, uh, <laughs> Clagmire, Putrid and Slurp, and... Uh, <laughs> And then, oh yeah, then there's the triplets. Triplets, yeah, yeah, yeah. Them that has gets, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what are the triplets' names? Oh, uh, they're, they're Mert, Bert, and Squirt. I see. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's, uh, oh yeah, there, there's the oldest sister, you know, Groucho. Groucho. <laughs> The sister's name is Groucho. <laughs> you know, they call her that because she has a mustache and smokes cigars. I... <laughs> yeah, that's the way it goes. Yeah. <laughs> well, that must make things pretty crowded around your house. Oh, they're sleeping all over the darn place. In the kitchen, too. Is that so? Yeah. They don't mind that. No, all except Cousin Twitchy... He ain't used to sleeping in a strange sink, oh, I <laughs> Well, they made themselves at home, didn't they? Oh, they did that. They're even wearing my clothes. Is that so? You know, herking her, or jerking her, I call it. <laughs> he got up this morning and got right into my best suit. Oh, well, now, that is annoying. Yeah, it certainly is. What's more, uh, he didn't even give me time to get out of it first, oh, <laughs> Well, I... Mortimer, these people, they don't sound like very attractive relatives. No. 
They sure made a mess of the house, too, I imagine. <laughs> I didn't I didn't realize how, how dirty the house was until a dog came in and tried to bury a bone in the living room. Is that... <laughs> Bury a bone in the living room. Yeah, we got wall to wall dirt now. <laughs> well, how could they drag so much dirt into the house? No, no, no. Oh, you know when those little kids when they go to sleep, you know what they play? They play that game. This little piggy went to market. Well, uh, that's very nice. Yeah, yeah, but they do it with real pigs all around. <laughs> I know it must annoy you, but remember, Martimer, blood is thicker than water. Well, I'm mad as oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> then again, what isn't? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's still it goes. Yeah. Well, relatives, of course, can be a problem. Do you know what Hubbard said about relatives? Well, I don't care to listen to anything... That kind of language, you know. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, you've heard the saying. Well, I don't... Haven't you heard it? I don't know. Well, uh, <laughs> Not yet, no. no. <laughs> well, it was Albert Hubbard. Oh, well, that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, well, I haven't said it yet. Oh. <laughs> the devil gives us our relatives. Thank God we can choose our friends. Now, what do you think of that? Well, how does it go? <laughs> he just went. Oh. I must have been looking the other way. Yeah. <laughs> now, Mortimer, how on earth are you going to get rid of that, that mob at your house? Well, I don't know. I don't think they're going to leave. Why do you say that? Well, I overheard Uncle Sorghum say, we'll stay until he gets wise. And, oh, I see. Well, I'm beginning to see the light. You are? Yes. Would you mind turning it up a little so I can see it too? Eh? I don't think he's your uncle. No? No. And I don't think they're your relatives at all. I think they're a bunch of, of imposters. Yeah, I do. You may be right at that. Yeah. <laughs> How can you be so stupid? <laughs> well, it comes easy after you reach the first plateau, I imagine. <laughs> Well, it's Carol Richards. I hope you'll excuse my coming out early, Edgar, but I've been so anxious to meet Mortimer. Oh, he's really cute. <laughs> oh, Mortimer, don't tell me you're a shrinking violet. Well, not exactly, no. I'm more of a stinkweed type. <laughs> Oh, come on now, Mortimer. Don't be afraid of me. Oh. I won't bite you. You won't, huh? Mm-mm. No teeth, huh? Oh. <laughs> I think you better sing, Carol. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's wrong, you string a long boy, then snap. Those eyes, those eyes, they're part of the tender track. You're hand in hand beneath the tree, and soon there's music in the breeze. You're acting kind of smart until your heart. Just goes well. Those trees that breeze, they're part of the tender track. Some starry night when his kisses make you tingle, he'll hold your hand and you'll hate yourself for being. Single and all at once it seems so nice. The trees are throwing shoes and rice. You hurry to a spot that's just a dot 
on the map. You wonder how it all came about. It's too late now, there's no getting out. You fell in love and love is a tender trap. Some starry night when his kisses make you tingle. He'll hold your hand and you'll hate yourself for being single and all at once it seems so nice. The folks are throwing shoes and rides. You hurry to a spot that's just a dot on the map. You wonder how it all came about. It's too late now. There's no getting out. You fell in love and love is a tender Now it is time for our Meet the People department. Our guest tonight is one of the foremost ethnologists in the United States, and his name is known the world over as one of the outstanding authorities on the American Indian. He holds the position of director of the Southwest Museum in Los Angeles. Here he is, Dr. Frederick Webb Hodge. Good evening, Dr. Hodge. Now, this is a real pleasure to have you with us tonight, and I realize it may not exactly be good form to inquire into a person's age. You know, Jack Benny seems to dislike such probing, but I confess that I'm curious about you. Is your age a secret, Doctor? No, I'm 39. Oh, no. <laughs> Not you, too. Uh, this is contagious. No, no, seriously, Dr. Hodge, about how old are you? Oh, uh, Mr. Bergen... To tell the truth, I was 91 the 28th of last month. Well. <laughs> 91 years. Well, isn't that wonderful? And how did you celebrate your birthday? Oh, well, my friends gave me a party and we really had a grand time. Oh, yes. Uh, Dr. Hodge, as the world's foremost authority on the American Indian, you probably devoted a great portion of your life to the study, haven't you? Well, as a lad in Washington, D.C., I became interested in Indians, and I never have outgrown that lure. It's been most fortunate, for to love one's work is one of the secrets of longevity, I believe. Yes. Well, now, while we're on the subject of longevity, you, you certainly should have some ideas on that. What is your thinking about, oh, smoking and liquor? Well, for years, I've smoked a pack and a half a day, and I enjoy an occasional drink. But my friends have always insisted I should indulge... Only in moderation, if I want to live to a ripe old age. <laughs> <laughs> and are your friends as chipper as you? Oh, most of them have passed on. I... <laughs> <laughs> they probably didn't take their own advice. Well, so you've given up alcoholic beverages then, haven't you? Not altogether. I still like a nightcap before retiring. Ah. I hope you're not like Effie Clinker. You don't find yourself retiring two or three times a night. Now. Oh, no. <laughs> One old-fashioned is quite enough for me. <laughs> and undoubtedly, you subscribe to getting ten hours of sleep per night? I prefer eight hours sleep, but can get along on seven. And I have thrived on six. When I was preparing the handbook of the American Indian, it was not unusual for me to sit up doing research, writing, reading proof, until two or three o'clock every morning. This lasted for 11 years. Well, you certainly do contradict all the rules I've ever heard laid down for longevity. <laughs> yes. Well, maybe so. But my opinion, there's nothing more important than leading a normal life. If I have a formula, it can probably be summed up as happy work, happy friends, happy family. I'm most fortunate being married to a charming, wonderful woman. I have good friends, and my life's work has been one I love. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that you... You've been interested in Indians since you were a boy. 
How did you happen to make it your profession? Well, I became field secretary of the Hemingway Expedition in 1886. Oh. That was the first organized archaeological expedition into the Southwest. And on the way, did you happen to pass Jack Benny in a covered wagon? <laughs> <laughs> no, but the expedition was a great success. And after my return to Washington, D.C. in 1889, I joined the Bureau of American Ethnology of the Smithsonian Institution. Well, now, what about the famous Hawaku expedition that you organized? Well, under the auspices of the Museum of the American Indian in New York, we made uh, expeditions to excavate the Hawaku ruin in New Mexico, which was identified as one of the so-called Seven Cities of Cibola. Mm -hmm. That is, the Zuni Indians of old. I see. Now, in conducting these excavations, just what do you look for? Uh, what is the index of the culture of the people? Is it the things they've left behind, I suppose? Well, primarily, in most instances, yes. However, the real test of the Indian's culture is not always discernible in the material things they leave. The Iroquois, for instance, left very little, yet they had reached perhaps the highest degree of culture than any other Indian tribes of, the, of uh, North America, north of Mexico. Well, in what way would you say the, did the Iroquois exceed that of other Indians? Well, in a great variety of ways. One of which was the freedom enjoyed by their women. Uh -huh. They had women's suffrage. And bear in mind that was many, many years before our own women were so privileged. Now, that is really surprising. Now, did the Iroquois women ever exercise their, well, what shall we call it, voting rights? Uh, yes, indeed. Yeah. The men could not even go to war without permission of the women. <laughs> That'd be a good way to eliminate war. By the time the women get through talking it over, the crisis would be over. <laughs> or they could just send the women. <laughs> Dr. Hodge, uh, you are now director of the Southwest Museum here in our city, isn't that right? Uh, not exactly. I have been director of the museum for 23 years, but at the close of January, I took a sabbatical leave. Ah, I see. To sort of rest up a little bit, huh? Well, of course not. I took the leave in order to devote my full time to research for the Department of Justice, Indian Claims Commission. In other words, as my mother used to say, it's like stopping work to haul timber. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, you're busier than ever now. Oh, yes. We are endeavoring to settle the Apache Indians' suit against the United States government for land said to have been taken from them, uh, thus involving large parts of the Southwest and to run into many millions of dollars. Sounds like a, a very important job. Well, Dr. Hodge, I, I want to thank you for being our guest tonight. A man like you who is 91 years young is certainly an inspiration to the rest of us. Thank you, Mr. Bergen. And it's getting a little late, so if you'd like, I'll drive you home after the show. Oh, there's no hurry to get home. <laughs> Let's have a nightcap. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's live it up. And thank you again, Dr. Hodge. And thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Gary Crosby returns to sing All at Once You Love Her. You start to light her cigarette And all at once you love her you scarcely talk, you scarcely met, but all at once you love her, you like her eyes, you tell her so, she thinks you're wise and clever. Just good night, and then you know you kiss good night forever. You wonder where your heart can go. Let's 
cigarette, first cigarette, and all at once, and all at once, you love her. You scarcely talk. You have scarcely talked. You scarcely met. Yes, you scarcely met. And all at once, and all at once, you love her. You like her eyes. You tell her so. She thinks you're wise and clever. Kiss good night. Kiss good night. And then you know. And then you know. You kiss good night forever. You wonder where your heart can go. Gentlemen, once again, it is time for our weekly excursion into the realm of culture. Tonight, our forum of intellectual titans bring their great wisdom and perception to bear on the ever-continuing scholastic debate, Wither Literature. Here they are, Edgar Bergen and his end table. Thank you. And good evening, Paddle. Oh, uh, Hiya, kid. <laughs> Crazy, uh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good evening, Professor Kirkwood, Professor Noble. And, well, if it isn't Mortimer Snurk. Well, if it isn't, the stork played a dirty trick on the mother. <laughs> That'll be enough. That's exactly what my parents said when they saw me. Uh. <laughs> Gentlemen, our subject for tonight is... Wither literature. Sure. Now, to start the discussion, would you like to define the meaning of literature? I, I say, uh, you chaps, look, I, I should be quite good on this subject, really. You know, I was born in a library. No, no, you were actually born in a library. Oh, yes, yes. How is that possible? Well, Mother kept trying to tell Dad, but the librarian kept saying, Shh. <laughs> <laughs> If your parents were smart, they'd have brought you back after two weeks. <laughs> they did, old boy. After all, I did have to be renewed, you know. Great. There's a North American van leaving for the Grand Canyon. Yes. Yeah. Why don't you get on it? <laughs> or better yet, get under it. <laughs> yeah, please, please, that will do. Uh, uh, Professor Kirkwood... What would you say is your favorite book? Well, it used to be Louie over on 3rd Street, but the cops grabbed him. No, no. <laughs> oh, too bad. Yeah, he was on his way to being Bookie of the Month. No. <laughs> Yes, Boogie of the Month. <laughs> <laughs> that was a loser. <laughs> Mr. Kirkwood, your education is sadly lacking. Oh, you hurt me, boy. Uh, <laughs> I'll have you know I went to school, and I really enjoyed that day. <laughs> you mean you only went to school one day? You're supposed to go back? <laughs> Let's continue. Now, Professor Snurd, who is your favorite author? Well, I... Oh, I think uh, I'd say offhand. Uh, oh, gosh, I... Uh, <laughs> oh, I know it as well as I know my name. Um, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, it, uh, mo, mo, no, no, that is my name. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, no. It, no, he's dead, too. Yeah. <laughs> let's see, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see. Oh, when they begin, oh, they begin. No, I don't know. Come on, now. I ask you, uh, who is your favorite author? Oh, author Godfrey. No, no, no. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Yeah. Hey, I, I hear he isn't around anymore. He just fired himself. Oh, no. <laughs> Gentlemen, 
And now, I'd like to get one sensible answer from this panel, if I'm not being too optimistic. Professor Noble, yes, do sir. you know Dickens' works? No, but I'm glad he got the job over. No, no. <laughs> to Charles Dickens. Oh, Charlie Dickens, of course, Charlie yes. Dickens. How silly of me. Yes. Oh, his books have always occupied an important position in our house. Is that so? Oh, yes, yes. See, we have a table with one short leg. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> This is hard to believe. Haven't you read any of Dickens' famous classics? You know you might enjoy Little Women. Oh, I have enjoyed quite a few of them. But when we're still on the subject of literature, I think I changed it for the better. <laughs> yeah. This is awful. <laughs> Our modern writers uh, have been compared unfavorably with the great 15th and 16th century authors, such as Shakespeare, Chaucer, and Bacon. Now, Mortimer... <laughs> What do you think? Well, I wasn't thinking. No, I... <laughs> How would you compare the modern ones with Shakespeare, Chaucer, and Bacon? Well, I'll have some. You'll have some. <laughs> have some what? Some of that bacon. No. <laughs> I'm speaking of Francis Bacon. Oh, the mule. No, not... <laughs> This is Bacon the Man. Oh, well, count me out. I ain't no cannonball. <laughs> I shouldn't have asked. Gentlemen, yeah. this is a discussion on literature. Certainly you have read some books. Oh, of course. Well, naturally, yes. Certainly, yes. That. I, mean, I just read that book about a bad day at Santa Anita. Yeah? <laughs> a book about a bad day at Santa Anita? Yeah, you know, the naked and the dead. No. <laughs> Yes. Well, you know, I, say, I say, did any of you chaps read that new English bestseller, the the typewriter murder mystery? No. Or who shifted Lady Chumley's carriage? <laughs> My favorite is one of those mother goose stories, you know, like little boy blue can blow your nose on the road. <laughs> You're a better man than I am, Rin Tin Tin. I like it. <laughs> Yeah, now, please, gentlemen, please. I say, Chess, the book I'm waiting for, uh, just between ourselves, is the new Kinsey Report. Yeah? Oh, yes. This one's on the love life of the mashed potato. Yeah. The love life of the mashed potato? Oh, yes, old boy. You'll be surprised at what goes on under that gravy. Is no. that... <laughs> Take a look sometime. <laughs> Gentlemen, we are here, I repeat again, to, to discuss the basic difference between modern and classical literature. And there are many of them. Mortimer, would you like to um, illustrate? Hmm? I say, <laughs> would you like to illustrate? Oh, no, I feel all right. No, no. <laughs> Maintain that we're taking this subject too lightly. Now you know that Socrates, what he said about the importance of literature. No, I don't think I was listening. No, I <laughs> he said it before you were born. Well, I know I wasn't listening. <laughs> For your information, Socrates lived many years ago in old Greece. I say he must have been a rancid old duck. <laughs> trying to keep this on a level keel at all. This, uh, I just can't cope with this abysmal ignorance being shown here tonight. This monumental illiteracy. The crass superficiality. The utter incompetence. Ah, ah, shut up. Up.
Charlie, I'm delighted to see you in such a meanable mood today. Uh, which a bold mood? Yeah, well, you know, easygoing, easy to get along with, likable, gentle. Well, it's this way, Bergen. Uh, a gentle act, a gentle word makes life pleasanter. Just like it says in the song. Uh, listen. Gentleness is welcome. You like that? I do, Charlie, because it's true. True not only of people, but of cigarettes. That's why for months, all Philip Morris smokers have enjoyed a new cigarette made gentle for modern taste. Born gentle, then refined to special gentleness in the making, this new cigarette comes as a wonderful surprise to veteran smokers, gives today's young smokers just what they require in a cigarette. Enjoy the gentle pleasure, the fresh, unfiltered flavor of new Philip Morris. You'll find it in a smart new red, white, and gold package. Have a gentle Philip Morris made gentle for you. Enjoy a new Philip Morris, the gentle cigarette. And now, here is Edgar Bergen. And now it's time for another bit of sage advice from our rural philosopher Mortimer. And here he is with Snurd's words for the birds. <laughs> Half a loaf is better than no rest at all. Fuck you. Till next Sunday, good night, everyone. <laughs> Remember to listen to Edgar Bergen with Charlie McCarthy, Mortimer Sturr, Ray Noble, and the entire ensemble next Sunday at the same time. Tonight's Edgar Bergen Show with Jack Kirkwood, Carol Richards, Gary Crosby, and the Mellow Men was produced and transcribed in Hollywood by Sam Pierce. Script by Cy Rose, Hilda Black, and Zeno Clinker. This is John Heaston speaking. Edgar Bergen, Charlie McCarthy, Ray Norville, and his orchestra, Anita Gordon, Mortimer Snurd, Pat Patrick, and Ursula Swing, Alan Reed, Jack Mather, and our special guests, Walt Disney and Donald Duck. Tonight we come to you from Pasadena, California, where we've just seen a preview of Edgar and Charlie's new picture, Fun and Fancy Free, by Walt Disney, which will have its world premiere in New York City on September 27th. And here are Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. Well, Charlie, what did you think of the picture? Oh, boy, great, great. I give it four bells. Why, you clumsy butterfingers, you... (laughs) 
That man is true. All right. Uh, well, I love the title, Fun and Fancy Free. You'd love anything that's free, baby. <laughs> well, frankly, my chest is sticking out with pride. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Your stomach is even prouder. Yeah. <laughs> Dolly, what do you think of, of your work in the picture? Oh, please, no. I can't. What? Well, you, you know how darn easy I blush. Oh. <laughs> oh, why must I be so cursed with all this talent? All right, all right. Well, there were others in the show besides you. You know, there was Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck. Well, Max, every picture has to have extras. Yes, I know. <laughs> and there's also Goofy. Oh, I say, did somebody call me? No, no, no. <laughs> Uh, no. where, where's Mr. Disney? Well, he'll be right back, Ray. Oh. Ray, don't you think we should show Mr. Disney our gratitude with a, a little speech of appreciation? Yes, that would be nice. I think it'd be nice. Yes, mm-hmm. Make him happy, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could tell him one of my uh, dreadfully droll witticisms. No. Uh-huh. no. Yeah. It, it, oh, this one's about a kangaroo. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if only I could remember the paunch line. Oh! <laughs> It. That's what's known as a foolproof joke. Yes, yes, yes. And you're just a fool that can prove it, too. <laughs> Ray, where do you get those awful jokes? Well, Edgar, uh, I, I just drop in at the barbecue place down the street. They're always good for a few ribs. Now, that's it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Now, Charlie, what about this speech? Uh, I don't think it's necessary for both of us to give one. No, no. So I think I'm going to let you do the talking for me. Uh, me do the talking for you? Yes. Well, now, that's an interesting switch, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Now, let me hear what you're going to say. Now, when you speak, you, you must speak from the diaphragm. Uh-huh. I have spoken. No. <laughs> and remember, you must be convincing. The best orator is one who can make his men see with their ears. Yeah? Yes, yes. Now, when I talk... They listen with their noses. No, no. <laughs> Well, go on with your speech, Charlie. Well, how is this? Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, fellow convicts. No, 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 no. I thought I was in school. No. <laughs> oh, there you are, Edgar. Well, Walt Disney. <laughs> and Donald Duck. <laughs> How did you like the picture? Mr. Disney, it behooves me to say that it was an honor. A great honor to work for you. Oh, Charlie, that's nice of you. An honor, I might say, I richly deserve. (laughs) Well, I hope we have the pleasure of working together again. That would be nice. Mr. Disney, I can do the same thing for you that I did for Bergen. Oh, no, thanks. I like to keep my hair. (laughs) Walt, I thought you did a splendid job in that picture. Are you kidding? He wasn't even in it. Oh. <laughs> well, don't you think Donald Duck gave a sterling performance? Sterling? Well, that's silver. I think of him more on the pewter side. <laughs> well, didn't you like Donald in that role? The, the only role I'd like him in is a casserole. <laughs> Look at the way he waddles. <laughs> Reminds me of Bergen coming out of the shower. Oh. oh, now, Donald, I'm sure that deep down inside, Charlie likes you very much. Uh, oh, what? Uh, <laughs> well, now, let's not start that. Uh, don't, you, don't you have something nice, Donald, to say to Charlie? Okay. Blum, blum. <laughs> Barnyard delinquent, I'll snatch you ball tails. Now, nah, Charlie, <laughs> let go of his feathers. Let go. <laughs> oh, now see, Charlie, what? you Perkins, you pull some of his tail feathers out. Okay, I'll stick them back in. There. <laughs> <laughs> Why, you Long Island entree, you? Why don't you fly south? <laughs> now let's not quibble about who's the best performer. Ray, who do you think contributed most to the picture? Uh, well, not merely because I wrote some of it, but I rather like the music. Especially the song that goes like this.
Some people like coffee better than others. They drink Chase and Sanborn. Yes, today that applies without fail. The better you like coffee, the better you like Chase and Sanborn now. Because now that finer coffees are available again, Chase and Sanborn gives them to you. You get shade-grown flavor in lavish abundance. And you get it in top condition, as it should be. Fresh from roasting, at the peak of its goodness, every pound is vacuum-packed. That's why people who like coffee best prefer Chase and Sanborn today. The finer coffees of the world are back, including superb shade-grown coffees. They're richer, more flavorful, more delicious, because they grow more slowly. You see, growing time is flavor-making time. Each day adds more flavor for Chase and Sanborn. And the vacuum pack gives you more of that flavor at its best and freshest than any other container in the world. This week, take advantage of that. Don't miss out. Now's the time to ask your grocer for Chase and Sanborn, the coffee with shade-grown flavor. <laughs> oh, chubble, Cuckoo la gumbo. Cuckoo. Cuckoo. Well, Marty Merton, here we are again. Oh, uh, where? <laughs> right here. Oh, yeah. Well, who? Well, <laughs> you and I. Oh, yeah, them, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the way it goes. Yeah. It's just like I always said, uh... So we said, you know. Yes. Yeah. Sure. You said what? Oh, I said, um... I've always said it. Uh... Now, what is it? Uh, see. I don't know, you know. I guess I don't say it no more. I... You saw the picture? Were you satisfied with your role? Um... Uh... Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Did you enjoy the picture? Oh, well, but it sure was scary. Scary? Oh, well, Mortimer, only very stupid people are frightened by a motion picture. Well, yeah. Well, I'm pretty sure I can qualify. Yeah. I suppose it was the big giant that frightened you. No, no, it was that other fellow there with the pigeon-toed eyes. Pigeon-toed eyes? Yeah. Looked like his face was button wrong. Button wrong. <laughs> well, now, who in the world could that have been? Must be. Scary person. Yeah, yeah. Scary, awful looking boy. Yeah. Well, describe him. Well, some of his teeth stuck out so far it looked like he swallowed a rake. Yeah. <laughs> Blonde hair? Yeah. Cross eyes? Yeah. And he had buck teeth? Yeah, that's the fellow. I'm beginning to see the light. Yep, yeah. Well, good morning. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you know the person's name. No. Well, now think. No, no, I give up. Well, it was Mortimer Snurd. Well, give me a better hint than that. Yeah. <laughs> Mortimer, you were in the picture. Oh. No. <laughs> I'm flabbergasted. Yeah. I hope seeing yourself in the picture isn't a disappointment. Well, I, I know that I was homely, but I didn't know I was so good at it. No. <laughs> well, don't let it upset you. No, I can't help it. It seeing me on the screen like that sort of... sort of destroyed something fine in me. I see. <laughs> what? My appetite. Oh, I see. <laughs> Not only that, they, they photographed my bad side. Your bad side? Yes. Yeah. Which one is that? The side my face is on. <laughs> I... Well, surely, Mortimer, you knew you were in the picture. What did you think we were doing at the studio every day under those lights? No. Charlie said we was getting a suntan. Yeah. <laughs> Charlie was ribbing you. Oh, if Charlie told you black was white, I bet you'd believe it. Uh, 
Lucille. Very good voice, like a fight, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, ain't it? No, no. Ah, uh, you certainly have more than your share of stupidity. Well, 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 it's the old story. Them who has, gets. Yeah, that's right. Mortimer, there's only one Mortimer snurf. Uh, Fram. Yeah, you... uh, Fram. Fram. Yeah. Uh, friends, I have come before you. You have? Uh, well, I haven't exactly come before you either because uh, you were here when I arrived. Yeah. But would you mind telling us, who are you? Well, I, um, I am from the state of uh, Iowa. From Iowa? Well, out here, who isn't? The oh. But I am from uh, Pinpoint, Iowa. Pinpoint. Yeah, well, it really, uh, it's really uh, East Pinpoint. Iowa. Oh, yeah. see, yeah. A suburb. Yeah. And uh, I understand that you had a showing of the new uh, Walt Disney picture, right. and it's about Jack and the Beanstalk. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we did. Uh, what about it? Well, why, why didn't you invite me? <laughs> uh, we were afraid you'd accept. <laughs> Well, what I want to know, Smarty, uh, well, I-, I want you to know that, that I am just plenty hot under the collar. Well, that's good. Yeah. Because you ain't so hot above it. Ah, <laughs> uh, 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 young man, uh, I'll have you know that I am an uh, exhibitor. Exhibitor? That's right. Uh, oh. and I, I represent a chain of uh, two theaters. Well, well. <laughs> well, we must be nice to an exhibitor, Charlie. Yes. And I have my finger on the pulse of the people, too. Now, you fresh thing. Uh-huh, all right. And why, just last week they were complaining. Yeah, no, no quality in the picture? No, no butter on the popcorn. Oh. <laughs> you don't mean that your popcorn is more important than the picture? Oh, I don't. Well, I mean, do you? Well, for goodness sakes, my gosh, I do. You do, yeah. yeah. Well, last week we had a 2,000 bag picture. Really? <laughs> I took my wife uh, to see it, and we ate popcorn all through the best years of our lives. <laughs> and now you can spend your remaining years drinking water. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I want to see uh, is if this uh, Disney picture has uh, popcorn appeal. Popcorn appeal? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll be glad to tell you about it. Oh, you will? I'll yes. sit over here. <laughs> uh, now, um... The story opens in a beautiful little place called Happy Valley, where everybody was happy. They were always laughing and laughing. (laughs) Pardon me, sir, but why are you crying in Happy Valley? I just moved here from Pasadena. (laughs) Well, nearly everybody was happy in the valley because of a beautiful golden harp that sang and played.
Gordon, that was the golden harp. No wonder they were happy. Yes, but one day, one day tragedy struck. From out of nowhere, a fearsome giant swooped down on me. And carried the singing harp away. Oh, no, no. Help. Get the FBI. Get Dick Tracy. Ken, do something. Calling all cars. Be on the lookout for a giant wanted for kidnapping a hot girl with red hair and... <whistles> that is all. <laughs> that is not all either. Here is an important announcement. We come to the table for nourishment, of course. But uh, <clears throat> it's the flavor of our food that makes eating a pleasure. You've always loved royal puddings for their rich, smooth deliciousness. You love them doubly these days of high food prices because they cost so little. Only a few pennies a serving. And what a hit they make. Royal puddings taste not just delicious, but more delicious, say, women who use them. Yes, from 1,052 royal users told why they switched to royal from other popular brands. Eight out of ten said royal puddings taste more delicious. And you'll agree when you try royal chocolate pudding. Such luscious chocolatey flavor reminds you of fine, rich milk chocolate. So smooth, creamy, textured, and easy to make. So no wonder women buy more royal puddings than any other kind. Get royal puddings tomorrow. No need any longer to put up with flavorless wartime brands. Insist on genuine royal. Remember, eight out of ten say royal puddings taste more delicious. And yet they cost only a few pennies a serving. <laughs> And now to get back to the story. Yeah, well, first wipe the pudding off your mouth. All right. <laughs> the singing harp was gone, and Happy Valley was no longer happy. Poverty and desolation came to everyone. They had just paid their taxes. No. <laughs> the poor people, the poor people were starving, starving, starving. Bergen, just tell it. Don't ham it. All right. <laughs> Friends, uh, this is going to be uh, just peachy for popcorn sales. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, and now comes the most tragic and dismal part of the story. I thought we just had it. No, no, no. Yes, we did. I- I've been just sitting there uh, whimpering and sniveling until my eyes are like little tiny red beads. Yes. <laughs> Well, there were three poor farmers who were desolate. All that stood between them and starvation was their cow. Won't take long to eat through her. <laughs> oh, now, now, just a moment. I, I hope you're not going to kill that poor, poor cow. No, no, they won't kill it. They're just going to take it to a used cow lot. <laughs> Operated by Madman Moose here. <laughs> That's true. But the used cow man was out of town, so they talked to his wife, Emma. About a fair deal. Well, what shape was she in? (laughs) Well, she was the type who should never wear slacks. No, no. (laughs) Or do you mean the cow? (laughs) Oh, it was a sad moment. Her big brown eyes flooded with tears as she stood there chewing and drooling. Uh, who, Emma or the cow? (laughs) Both of them. All right. (laughs) So when the woman said to the cow... She said, are you a good milker? And the cow said, yes, (laughs) ma'am. And would you favor us with a quart of milk? No. (laughs) And why not? I'm not in the mood. A talking, a talking cow? Yes. Why, that's utter nonsense. Yes. So they traded the cow for three magic beans and planted the beans in the ground. My word, of all places. Yes. And the magic beans started to grow up, 
Up, up, and up. Everybody fasten your safety belts, please. <laughs> and then one by one, they started to climb up the beanstalk. <laughs> Oh, boy, what a climb of that bean spark. Uh, I'm, all, I'm all out of breath. Me too. My cow. <laughs> My word, look at that magnificent castle. Let's go in. Yeah, let's go in. Ooh, kind of spooky. Take you in my arms. Mm. Oh, you tickle. <laughs> I'll hold you a little closer. Oh, oh. guess I held you too close. <laughs> Big five, four, five. Oh, what's that? What's that? That's the horrible giant. You're not afraid, are you? No, I always have lavender skin. <laughs> Blood of an English bird. Oh, but really now, please don't I? <laughs> I'm not got you anyway. I'm so anemic, you see. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Fee, fi, fo, fo. Fo, fo? What happened to fun? He's with Abner. Oh. I'm glad you came. You're just in time for dinner. Oh, thank you. In fact, you'll be my dinner. Yeah. Oh, no. No, not that. Oh, sir, have mercy. Why do you want to eat a scrawny little boy like me? I'm on the Clark Gable diet. <laughs> well, if you let me go, I'll give you this little duck for a pet. Oh, I like little pretty ducks. And I have a nice warm place for him to stay. Oh. In my oven. <laughs> Don't you know no one's allowed up here on this beanstalk? What are you doing here? We, we just came to borrow a saw and an axe to chop down a beanstalk to get rid of a big nuisance. Oh, well, in that case, I'll help you. Yes. Here is the saw. Thanks, and please. here is the... Yes. What? Beanstalk. <laughs> Come here, Come you. Come here, please, Donald. Come on, down the beanstalk. <laughs> wasn't he? <laughs> what a story, huh? And what a picture. Uh, yes, but it will it sell popcorn. Oh. <laughs> Charlie and Edgar will be back in just a moment, but first, you know, some days turn out better than others. But here's a way you can raise the average. Take a tip from the people who like coffee best. Get Chase and Sanborn coffee. The more important your coffee is to you, with meals and between, the better you like Chase and Sanborn now, because finer coffees are back. Yes, Chase and Sanborn is richer today, more flavorful, more delicious. Taste its bonus of shade-grown goodness, protected by the vacuum pack. You get finer flavor and more of it, because the whole world's finer coffees are once more available for us to choose from. And preference goes to shade-grown coffees with their lavish abundance of extra flavor. Under an awning of taller trees, these coffees grow more slowly. Each day they store up more pleasure for you. And you get it in Chase and Sanborn in the vacuum pack. Only the vacuum pack can give you so much freshly roasted flavor. Because no other container keeps coffee fresh. So don't miss out. This week, remember, now is the time to ask your grocer for Chase and Sanborn coffee. <laughs> Our 
Yes, next Sunday will be Betty Hutton. Betty Hutton? Woody! Coming to see me? <laughs> what a match that'll be. What do you mean? <laughs> the blonde bombshell meets the red-headed blockbuster. <laughs> Join us then next Sunday to Edgar Bergen, Charlie McCarthy, Mortimer Snurd, Ray Noble, Anita Gordon, Pat Patrick, and their special guest, Betty Hutton.